Lighthouse Scientific Education presents a lecture in the Acids and Bases series. The topic, pH and titration. Material in this lecture relies on understanding of the previous lectures, Acids and Bases, Basics, Covalent Bonding, and Ionic Bonding. The lecture begins with a review of Arrhenius Acids and Bases, since their reactions take place in water. The autoionization of water follows right behind. That leads to the definition of pH, with a description of the pH scale, an introduction into indicators, and a discussion of buffers. The other major topic of the lecture is titration. After an introduction, an important equation relating amounts of acids and bases is examined. Finally, a review of titration curves is presented. Much of this lecture involves aqueous solutions. Arrhenius acids and bases take place in water. An Arrhenius acid increases the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. An Arrhenius base increases the hydroxide concentration in a solution. A defining feature of Arrhenius acids and bases is the neutralization reaction. In water, an acid, hydrogen ion donor, and a base, hydroxide ion donor, react to form a salt and water. Water is considered neutral. An example is aqueous hydrochloric acid plus aqueous sodium hydroxide produces a salt, aqueous sodium chloride, and water. If viewed from a net ionic equation perspective, as was shown in the previous lecture, the reaction would reduce down to the formation of water from hydrogen ion and hydroxide, while the reaction arrow points at the formation of water. The reaction, like most reactions, is really in equilibrium. The reaction goes in both directions. And that reaction takes us to the start of the discussion of pH. It begins with autoionization, also called self-ionization and auto-dissociation. It is where a compound breaks down into ions. Instead of the reaction of the formation of water, consider the reverse reaction, the breakdown of water. In the previous lecture, it was said that the hydrogen ion does not exist alone in aqueous solution. It interacts with another water molecule and forms hydronium ion. In water, hydrogen ion and hydronium ion essentially mean the same thing. Still, a more accurate description of the breakdown of water is the formation of a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. No real difference here, but a second water molecule is needed to balance the reaction. It should be noted that this breakdown occurs on the order of one in every 500 million water molecules, so it is by no means common but occurs enough to be relevant. To proceed, we need to introduce a new symbol. It is a pair of square brackets. When placed around a compound, it reads concentration of that compound. The actual concentration need not be known. The brackets are just a shorthand way of saying concentration. When placed around the hydronium ion, it reads the concentration of hydronium. Placed around the hydroxide ion, it reads the concentration of hydroxide. Why do we need this symbol? Because it allows us to write relationships based on concentration. In pure water, at 25 degrees Celsius, the concentration of hydronium times the concentration of hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. That is a constant value and given the designation Kw. Kw is the water ionization constant. From the autoionization equation, we see that the breakdown of a water molecule produces one hydronium ion, hydrogen ion, and one hydroxide ion. They come in a one-to-one -one ratio. Therefore, in pure water, the concentration of hydronium should be equal to the concentration 
of hydroxide. Taking this equality and performing some algebra and exponential math with the KW equation gives a concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7th molar. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7th molar times 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7th molar equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th. The exponential math here says to add the exponents. Minus 7 plus minus 7 is minus 14. The last point on this topic is that in a solution where the concentration of hydronium is equal to the concentration of hydroxide, the solution is called neutral. Pure water is neutral. That takes us to pH. pH is short for power of hydronium ion. It also is a way of expressing the strength of acids and bases. pH is defined as the negative log of the hydronium concentration. The negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration is more commonly used. Either one will do. The power is the log. It allows a huge range of numbers to be expressed over a reasonable size scale. Scaling powers of 10 is pH's only reason to exist. Seismic reading for earthquakes and decibel levels for sound use the same principle. The log scale is a construct, not a real thing. It can be applied to anything, including pOH. It is defined as the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. pOH is rarely used, but it is a complement of pH and will factor into our understanding of the subject. Keeping these definitions and bringing back the autoionization of water. Under these stated circumstances, hydronium and hydroxide concentration are equal. Under these circumstances, pH is equal to pOH. That can be verified by substituting in the definition of pH and pOH. The negative log of the hydronium concentration equaling the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. And then putting in the concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. We have a mathematical relationship that solves as 7 equals 7. The negative log of 10 to the minus 7 is 7. Solving this type of math is covered in more detail in the Acids and Bases Advanced Concepts lecture. pH 7 is neutral. pOH 7 is neutral. Can the pH be added to the pOH? Sure. pH plus pOH equals 14. That is an important value, and we will explore it a bit deeper. Okay, starting again with the pure water. We will bring back the definition of the Kw, the water ionization constant. Kw equals a hydronium ion concentration times a hydroxide ion concentration. This, as we saw, is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. The same power math, small p, can be done with Kw as was done with pH and pOH. pKw equals the negative log of Kw, or the negative log of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. pKw equals 14. What else equals 14? Right, pH plus pOH. pKw equals pH plus pOH. pH is tied to the autoionization of water, and this equation allows a direct connection between pH and pOH. To put some perspective to pH, acid and base strength is measured on a scale of 0 to 14. The scale can be visualized using the hydrogen ion concentration or the pH. There are some parameters to this scale already covered in the lecture. The water ionization constant, K2, 
PKW was 10 to the minus 14. PKW is 14, and 14 is generally placed at the top of the scale. In pure water, at 25 degrees C, pH equals pOH. In putting concentration values, has the pH of 7 being neutral. The center of the scale is neutral, with a pH of 7. However, we are interested in solutions other than pure water. Solutions with a pH above 7, that is a lower hydrogen ion concentration than neutral, are basic solutions. pH 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 are all basic pHs. The scale goes higher, but anything above 14 essentially has no hydronium ion. As a note, this part of the scale is also called alkaline, or the solutions have alkalinity. We'll just stick with basic. Solutions with the pH below 7, that is a higher hydrogen ion concentration than neutral, are said to be acidic solutions. pH 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0 are increasingly acidic pHs. The scale actually goes into negative numbers, but we will consider those as extremely acidic. Just to head off some possible confusion, a brief review of scientific notation and decimal notation is offered. Several concentrations spanning the scale have been pulled aside and will be compared to their decimal values. The most important thing to remember about scientific notation is that the negative sign in the exponent does not mean that the number is negative. The negative sign indicates how many places to the right of the decimal point the coefficient of the scientific notation begins. The negative sign in the exponent says that the value is less than 1. 10 to the negative 14 is a number with 13 zeros and a 1. There are 14 digits to the right of the decimal point. This is a really small number, but as a hydrogen ion concentration, its pH is positive 14. Those facts need to be reconciled when dealing with pH. 10 to the minus 9 has 8 zeros and a 1 to the right of the decimal point. 10 to the negative 7 has 6 zeros and a 1 to the right of the decimal point. 10 to the negative 3 and 10 to the negative 2 follow the same pattern. Written this way, we can see why a scale going from 0 to 14 is so much more convenient. A solution of pH 14 has a hydrogen ion concentration that is 1 trillion times smaller than a solution of pH 2. Returning to the scale, some examples are in order. Lye, that is either composed of sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, has an extremely high and basic pH of 13 to 14. Ammonia is also rather basic, coming in with a pH of about 11. Our blood is very close to neutral. It has a slightly basic nature, coming in at about 7.4. On the slightly acidic side is rain. Rain is not pure water, so it will not have a pH of 7. Rain has dissolved carbon dioxide in it, which makes it slightly acidic. As for citric fruit, oranges are about pH 3.8. Lemons are a tart pH 2. That's comparable to stomach acid. On the nastier side, there is battery acid, which has a place on the bottom rung of this ladder. What type of pH questions do students come across? An example would be, is blank, acidic, or basic? The way to answer this question is by finding the pH of blank. If the pH is above 7, blank is basic. If the pH is below 7, blank is acidic. And then there are questions concerning the relationship between pH and pOH, such as, given a pOH of 8, what is the pH? These questions rely on the relationship pH plus pOH equals 14. 
algebraically solving for the unknown has the pH equal to 14 minus pOH. If the question gives the pH and asks for the pOH, then this arrangement is used. Some students will be asked to have a familiarity with the relationship between concentration and pH, such as the concentration of 4.2 times 10 to the minus 8 is near what pH? In the acids and base advanced concepts lecture, this conversion is done on the calculator and in more detail. Here we will look at getting a rough estimate without the need of a calculator. Part 1 is to get the exponent of the concentration and change its sign. In this question, the exponent is minus 8. Changing the sign makes it a positive 8. If the coefficient in the scientific notation is 1, then the modified exponent from part 1 is the correct pH. If not, then the modified exponent is an upper limit pH. And that may be good enough. For more accuracy, part 2 is to look at the coefficient. And if it is greater than 3, decrease the modified exponent by 1. 4.2 is greater than 3, so decrease 8 by 1. A pH 7 is the more accurate answer. A good answer is just to say between pH 7 and 8. Let's do a few more examples on this kind of question. Find the nearest pH unit given a concentration of 7.2 times 10 to the minus 4. Step 1 has us take the exponent, minus 4. Change the sign to positive 4. Step 2 says to decrease by 1 since 7.2 is greater than 3. The pH is between 3 and 4 and closer to 3. With 5.0 times 10 to the negative 9th, the exponent negative 9 is changed to positive 9, and the coefficient of 5 has us decrease 9 by 1. The pH is between 8 and 9, closer to 8. With 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5, the exponent is negative 5 and is converted to positive 5. But since the coefficient of 1.2 is not greater than 3, the 5 remains a 5. The pH is between 4 and 5, but closer to 5. The next point of inquiry is how to measure the pH of a solution. There are a couple common ways, and they vary in specificity. By now, we should know that in the lab, pH is a commonly measured quantity. How it is measured is dependent on what is being done with the solution and how precise the pH value needs to be known. Sometimes, all that is needed is a pH indicator. As the name suggests, these indicate or show the general pH of a solution. If all that is needed is to determine if a solution is acidic or basic, red or blue litmus paper will do the job. These are less informative indicators. Essentially, chemicals on the paper have a weak affinity for hydrogen ions and show different colors depending on whether the hydrogen ion is bound or unbound. That is, one color when the pH is lower than 7 and another color when the pH is above 7. Dipping blue litmus paper into an acidic solution will turn the paper red. Dipping red litmus paper in a basic solution will turn the paper blue. There are more informative forms of litmus paper. Some use a rainbow spread of colors to indicate the pH of a solution over a large pH range. Dipped into an acidic solution will show the paper to be on the reddish side. Neutral solutions will be yellowish, and dipped into a basic solution will find the paper to be bluish. More traditional indicators can be made from common vegetables. Cabbage juice can be used as an indicator. All that is required to be an organic indicator is for there to be a color change in moving from one specific pH to another. Sometimes that is moving from acidic to basic at pH 7, but not necessarily. The cabbage juice undergoes several color changes in moving from pH 2 to pH 14. Of particular interest are titration indicators. 
titration will be covered shortly. Titration indicators need to show when the slow mixing of two solutions passes through neutral pH. Phenolphthalein is probably the most commonly used indicator in the lab. Under acidic conditions, a drop of phenylalanine added to a solution has no color. Under basic conditions, it turns the solution magenta or purple. Phenolphthalein is a good indicator for a neutralization reaction. And then there is the pH meter. It is a delicate machine that requires calibration but gives very precise and accurate pHs. Essentially, it is a voltmeter. The technical description is that it measures the difference in electrical potential between a pH electrode and a reference electrode. The pH electrode is what is inserted into the solution of interest. Basically, the pH meter measures hydrogen ion activity. It determines acidity and alkalinity. Some hands-on practice determining pH from the various methods usually solidifies a student's understanding of indicators. Commonly taught with pH is the concept of a buffer. Buffers are chemicals added to a solution. A buffered solution is an aqueous solution that resists changes in pH. A buffer is needed in solution when there is chemistry going on that changes the amount of protons but for whatever reason, the pH needs to remain somewhat constant. Your and my blood needs to maintain a constant pH, and it does so with buffers. In a buffered system, a small amount of acid or base can be added or produced in a reaction with little change in the pH. The hydrogen ion concentration remains relatively constant. A good buffer only keeps the pH relatively constant and it stays out of the way of the other chemicals in the solution. It is not part of the chemistry of interest. A buffering solution is capable of maintaining the pH because a component of the buffer can remove protons with the addition of acid or the production of protons in the reaction. Another component of the buffer can release protons with the addition of base to the solution or the consumption of protons in a reaction. How can a buffer both release and absorb protons? A buffer solution contains a combination of a weak acid and its conjugate base, or vice versa, a weak base and its conjugate acid. Referring back to the previous acid-base lecture where conjugate acids and bases were discussed, an acid, generic HA, plus a base, generic B, react to form a conjugate base to the acid and a conjugate acid to the base. The acid and its conjugate base differ by a single hydrogen. The base and its conjugate acid differ by a single hydrogen. It is important to note that any one type of buffer can only buffer a solution around a specific pH range, generally one to two pH units. Fortunately, there are many types of buffers to choose from and the correct buffer can be chosen to buffer at a desired pH. For instance, one buffer may maintain the pH between pH 3 and 4, while another buffer maintains the pH between pH 8 and 9. Now, consider buffering at some specific pH. It doesn't have to be identified here. For buffering at a specific acidic pH, an acid conjugate base must be chosen in which the concentration of the acid is approximately equal to the concentration of its conjugate base. This only happens over a limited 1 to 2 pH range and is why buffering has a 1 to 2 pH limitation. For buffering at a specific basic pH, a base and its conjugate acid must be chosen that has the concentration of the base being approximately equal to the concentration of its conjugate acid. That too only happens over a specific 1 to 2 pH range. This is a fair amount of information, so let's look at a specific example with acetic acid. It is a weak acid. To a limited degree, the acidic hydrogen pops off the acid, leaving a conjugate base, acetate. 
When added to a solution, this weak acid and its conjugate base will only form a buffer under conditions in which the concentration of the acid is approximately equal to the concentration of the conjugate base. Turns out, this only happens over the pH range 3.5 to 5.6. When that is so, and there is an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration, the buffer can remove protons from the solution. Using the reaction equation, a buffer handles an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration by having the conjugate base pick up excess protons and reform the acid. At the buffering pH, there is enough acetate ion in solution to pick up the extra hydrogen ion and reform the acetic acid. The other capacity the buffer brings is the ability to release protons or hydrogen ions when there is an addition of a base or an absorption of protons in a reaction. The decrease in hydrogen ion is handled by the weak acid, dissociating into hydrogen ions and conjugate base. At the buffering pH, there is enough acetic acid in solution to dissociate and return the hydrogen ion concentration into the pH buffering range. Summation. Buffers work at a pH in which there is sufficient weak acid and conjugate base or weak base and conjugate acid. The acid-base reaction goes in both directions as needed. How does one know which buffer to choose for a specific solution? Look it up. There are lists that provide the buffer options based on its 1 to 2 pH range. Buffering at low pHs is done with weak acids in their conjugate base. Buffering at high pHs is done with weak bases in their conjugate acid. A final topic of buffer is a look at one of the most important buffers in the world, the one that maintains the pH of your and my blood. Human blood is buffered around a neutral pH, approximately 7.4. It varies little from that pH. Blood uses the bicarbonate buffer system. It is controlled by the rate of respiration, that is the production of carbon dioxide, which is a gas that we breathe out. Cells release carbon dioxide, which reacts with the water in our blood. In essence, we have carbonated water in our blood. Fortunately, carbon dioxide in water is in equilibrium with carbonic acid, H2CO3. This helps to keep the bubbles down. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. A small amount of it will dissociate into hydrogen ions and the conjugate base bicarbonate the bicarbonate buffer system. This system is in equilibrium. The reaction goes in both directions. There's a lot of chemistry going on in the blood. Sometimes there is a decrease in the amount of hydrogen ion. If that is allowed to proceed, the pH will rise and the disorder called alkalinia will occur. Fortunately, there is sufficient carbonic acid to dissociate in hydrogen ion and bicarbonate, which returns the pH to its proper level. If the carbonic acid concentration gets too low, CO2 and H2O in the blood form more acid. There is always more CO2 being formed in the cells. At other times, there may be an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. If that is allowed to proceed, the pH will decrease and the disorder called acidemia will occur. Again, the blood is capable of handling this. At the buffering pH, there is sufficient bicarbonate to pick up excess hydrogen ions and reform the carbonic acid. If the carbonic acid concentration gets too high, H2CO3 forms more CO2 and H2O. The excess CO2 is then breathed out. Quite a nice little buffering system that starts with just carbon dioxide and water. The second major topic of the lecture is titration. Titration is a laboratory technique that uses a solution of known concentration called the titrant to determine the concentration of an unknown solution called the titrate. 
At this level of chemistry, titration almost exclusively refers to a method for determining the concentration of an unknown acid or base. We will limit all of our discussion to just this one kind of titration. Acid-base titration uses a neutralization reaction in which equal amounts of acid and base are added together to form a salt and water. From a net ionic equation perspective, titration is equating the amount of aqueous hydrogen ion with the amount of aqueous hydroxide. That is the objective of Mohs acid-base titration. There's a standard procedure. A solution of known concentration called the titrant is slowly added to a solution of known volume, but unknown concentration called the titrate. Titrant is added until the titrate is neutralized. This is called the equivalence point, and it is where the amount of hydrogen ion equals the amount of hydroxide ion. There are several ways of solving for a titrate concentration in a titration. One is through stoichiometry. Not all students will follow that path, but for those who do, the topic is explored in the Acid and Bases Advanced Concepts Lecture. Another more straightforward approach is used when the titration involves strong acids and strong bases. The simplest version of that approach uses this basic equation. The molarity of the titrant times the volume of the titrant is equal to the molarity of the titrate times the volume of the titrate. Since molarity times volume is amount, this equation is really just a practical version of this equation. Titration is equating amounts of acid and base. Looking at the individual terms, the molarity of the titrant is the known concentration of a solution that is being slowly added to the volume of the titrate. The purpose of the titration is to find the unknown concentration of the titrate. Four variables. Three are known or measured, and one is unknown. This equation may look somewhat familiar. The molarity times volume on one side of the equation equaling the molarity times volume on the other side is similar in form to the dilution equation covering the concentration in dilution lecture in the water and solution series. C1V1 equals C2V2, in which the subscript 1 indicates before the dilution and 2 indicates after the dilution. When concentration is given a molarity, the equation can be written M1V1 equals M2V2. Even though this equation is only valid for a single solution, dilution problems solve in a very similar way to titration problems. Algebraically solve for the unknown and insert known or measured values. Solving for the unknown in a titration experiment, the molarity of the titrate, begins by dividing both sides of the equation by the volume of the titrate. Volume of titrate cancels out on the right-hand side of the equation, leaving the molarity of the titrate isolated. This is the equation used in titration of strong acids and bases. A common stumbling block with this equation is with the terms titrate and titrant. They are really quite similar and are easily mixed up. It's worth the effort to straighten them out before proceeding much further. Or Replace titrant and titrate with acid and base. If the solution of unknown concentration is the base, then the molarity of the base is solved for. If the solution of unknown concentration is the acid, then the molarity of the acid is solved for. The format of the equation is the same. But let's not completely disregard titrant and titrate. An illustration of a titration may help sort out the terms. Say there is a flask containing a strong acid of unknown concentration. A similar argument could be made using a strong base, but we will use acid as our titrate. 
the concentration of the acid is not known. But the volume in the flask is known. It was measured prior to the titration. Since there will be a mixing of titrate and titrant, a stir bar is usually added to the flask. We will say that the flask is placed upon a magnetic stir plate so that the bar is spinning around and quickly mixing the solution. Acid-based titration is a neutralization reaction. The titration is complete when the acid is neutralized by the addition of base. That is going to be somewhere near pH 7. How do we know when the acid has been neutralized? A drop of an indicator was added at the beginning. Often the indicator is phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is clear under acidic conditions and magenta under basic conditions. The stir bar quickly mixes up the indicator and the solution returns to clear. Keeping track of our variables, there is a known volume of titrate, but an unknown concentration. That's the molarity of the titrate. A base titrant needs to be added to neutralize the acid. The concentration of the base is known prior to the titration. Often, preparing the titrant is part of the experiment. The volume of titrant needed to achieve neutralization of the acid is the experimentally measured quantity. To add titrant in a controlled, inaccurate manner, a device called a burette is used. It is a long glass tube with calibrations on the side. It is somewhat like a graduated cylinder, but at the bottom, it is a stopcock, which when turned, drips titrant into the titrate. Keeping track of the variables, the concentration of the titrant is a known quantity. What is not yet known is the volume of titrant needed to completely neutralize the acid. Looking at the titration equation, the volume of titrate is known, as is the molarity of the titrant. Measured with the burette is the volume of titrant. When these values are added into the equation, the concentration of the unknown titrate is calculated. What's left for us to discuss is how the volume of titrant is determined. It is a measured quantity. That value is gotten by noting amounts on the burette. The volume of titrant delivered is the initial volume of the titrant in the burette at the beginning of the experiment minus the final volume of the titrant in the burette at the point of neutralization of the acid in the flask. So a titration experiment will only call for two measured volumes. The easy one is the initial volume. It is the volume before the experiment starts. Simply read the bottom of the meniscus on the titrant in the burette. The final volume is where the skill of the procedure lies. The stopcock is slowly opened and titrant drops into the flask. Early in the titration, small splashes of magenta are seen but quickly disappear as the base is mixed in with the acid. As the neutralization of acid proceeds, the titrate shows these splashes of magenta for longer and longer periods of time. Finally, the addition of a single drop of titrant turns the entire solution magenta. No more titrant is added. The experiment is completed. The acid has been neutralized. The amount of acid in the flask is equal to the amount of base. The final volume is read right off the burette at the amount of remaining titrant. That's a procedure for an acid-based titration. Let's look at an example problem to see how the experimental process and the titration equation combine to give us the concentration of an unknown. What is the concentration of 50 mL of HCl that titrates to neutrality with 19.8 mL of 0.50 molar in AOH? First, we will consider the problem from the perspective of the experiment. Is the acid or the base the titrate? 
Well, since the concentration of the acid is asked for, it must be the titrate. What is the experimentally determined quantity in the titration experiment? What is the volume of the titrant? It is given in the problem as 19.8 mil. But where would that have come from? It would have had to come from some initial and final volume on the burette. If 50 mil of the HCl is added to a flask and 0 0.50 molar NOH is added to the burette, the initial volume would have been noted prior to the titration. The titration would start and proceed until the acid is completely neutralized by the base. The final volume is read off the burette, and the volume of titrant is found by taking the initial volume and subtracting the final volume. That's the process of titration. Solving the problem is done through our normal problem-solving mechanism. In the setup, the problem is reviewed for known and unknown values. The molarity of the titrant, which is the base, is given in the problem as 0 0.50 molar. The volume of the titrant is given in the problem as 19.8 mil. The molarity of the titrate, the acid, is unknown, and the volume of the titrate is given in the problem as 50 mils. These are the known and unknowns in the problem. What equation or relationship relates these values? It is the acid base titration equation. From the setup, it can be seen that the molarity of the acid is the unknown. To isolate the molarity of the acid, divide both sides of the equation by the volume of the acid, getting this usable form of the equation. Take that equation to the solve step and insert the known values. The molarity of the base, 0 0.50 molar NaOH, times the volume of the base, 19.8 mil, divided by the volume of the acid, 50 mil. Mil cancel out, leaving the unit's molarity, and the unknown concentration of the acid is 0 0.198 molar. There are a fair amount of pieces in a titration problem, so approaching it in a stepwise fashion is probably the wise move. Hands-on experience is always the best. The final topic of the lecture is titration curves. Monitoring the pH of the titrate during the addition of titrant shows the progression of the reaction. A titration curve is a plot of the pH versus the volume of added titrant. Getting a titration curve is essentially just like a titration experiment, but instead of using an indicator like phenolphthalein to note the neutralization of the titrate, a pH meter is inserted into the titrate and values are read along the way. Some pH meters are connected to computers and the value of the pH can be plotted against the addition of titrant. Titration curves vary depending on the acid and base used in the neutralization reaction. The first curve shown will be for a strong acid titrate and a strong base titrant. Along the x-axis is plotted the volume of the base titrant as it is added to the acid titrate. Along the y-axis is plotted the pH at each particular volume of added base. Before any base is added, the initial pH will be the pH of the acid. That is all there is in the flask. As base is added, some of the acid is neutralized and the pH rises. Near the neutralization, a small amount of base causes a large rise in pH. The remaining acid is quickly being overcome by the addition of the strong base. After the acid has been neutralized, the pH continues to rise rapidly because strong base is still being added and there is no acid left to neutralize. 
eventually the pH levels out and approaches the pH of the base titrant. At the beginning of the experiment, the solution is all acid. At the end of the titration, it is mostly base. The volume of base at which the acid is completely neutralized is called the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, the solution mix has equivalent or equal quantities of acid and base. For a titration curve with a strong acid and base, the equivalent point is equal distance from the highest pH and the lowest pH. Compare this titration curve to one produced from a weak acid and a strong base titrant. Weak acids are not as acidic as strong acids. The initial pH will not be as low as it was with the strong acid. The reaction proceeds in a somewhat similar manner. The neutralization occurs at roughly the same volume of base, but the equivalence point is at a higher pH than that seen with the strong acid. For a weak acid nitrate, the initial pH and the pH at the equivalence point is higher than that seen with a strong acid titrate. What about a titration curve that has a base as the titrate and a strong acid as the titrant? The acid and base are both strong. This time the x-axis has volume of acid titrate that is added to the base titrate. pH is still on the y-axis. The titrate is a strong base, so the initial pH will be very high. With the addition of acid titrate, the base becomes neutralized. Near the equivalence point, a small amount of acid causes a large decrease in the pH, since most of the base has been neutralized. That will be close to a pH of 7. The volume of acid added to get to the equivalence point is the volume of titrant used to solve the unknown concentration of base. Adding acid past the equivalence point produces a rapid drop in the pH that approaches that of the strong acid. In the end of the experiment, the solution is mostly strong acid. Compare this titration to one in which the titrate is a weak base. Weak bases have lower pHs than strong bases, so the initial pH will be lower. The titration proceeds in a similar manner, but the equivalence point is at a lower pH than that seen with the strong base. For a weak base, the initial pH and the pH at the equivalence point is lower than that seen with a strong base titrate. Comparing the titration curves with bases as titrates to those with acids as titrates, we can see that they are mere images of each other. Base titrate curves go down, acid titrate curves go up. Since they are both monitoring acid-base neutralization, it's not too surprising that there are similarities. The last type of titration curve that we will cover is that for polyprotic acids. In the previous lecture, we saw that polyprotic acids are capable of losing more than one proton per compound in an acid-base reaction. Bringing back carbonic acid as an example, it can lose a hydrogen ion to the neutralization reaction, leaving a bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate is a very weak acid, but it can donate that acidic hydrogen to a neutralization reaction. The titration curve that fully titrates carbonic acid will have two equivalence points. In a titration with polyprotic carbonic acid as a titrate and a strong base as a titrant, the volume of base is on the x-axis. The initial pH will be that of carbonic acid. 
a full neutralization reaction will occur with that first hydrogen. There is an equivalence point, as would be expected for a weak acid. There is also a full neutralization titration for the second acidic hydrogen. Being a weak acid, it starts at a higher pH. There is also an equivalence point for this part of the titration. Polyprotic acid titration is really the sum of multiple titration curves. If the polyprotic acid has three acidic protons, like phosphoric acid, H3PO4, there would be a third titration curve added at the end of the first two. And that concludes the material for the lecture. Recapping the lecture, a review of Arrhenius acids and bases gave us a foundation for the autoionization of water. That is, water breaking down into hydrogen and hydroxide. It is not a common reaction. In fact, at 25 degrees Celsius in pure water, the concentration of hydronium ion times hydroxide ion is a very small value, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. That number is called the water ionization constant, and it is given the designation Kw. pH is a way of expressing the strength of acids and bases. It is a construct and defined as the negative log of the hydronium concentration. The negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration works just as well. POH is defined as the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. Pure water at 25 degrees C, the concentration of hydronium ion is equal to the concentration of hydroxide. That will be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. That is a pH and pOH of 7. pH 7 is neutral. Acid base strength is measured on a 0 to 14 pH scale. Solutions with a pH above 7, that's a low hydrogen ion concentration, are basic. Solutions with a pH below 7, that's a high hydrogen ion concentration, are acidic. There are several ways of determining a pH. There are indicators like litmus paper and chemicals like phenolphthalein. And then there's the more accurate pH meter. This measures hydrogen ion activity. Indicators give the acidity and alkalinity of a solution. A buffer is an aqueous solution that resists changes in pH. They are formed by the combination of a weak acid and its conjugate base, or vice versa. That's a weak acid in the conjugate base, or a weak base in the conjugate acid. We also looked at blood buffering. It uses carbon dioxide and is referred to as the bicarbonate buffer system. Titration is a technique that uses a solution of known concentration, titrant, to determine the concentration of an unknown solution, titrate. Often, it uses a neutralization reaction. Neutralization is shown with an indicator like phenolphthalein or with a pH meter. The objective is to measure the volume of titrant necessary to reach the equivalence point. That is where the amount of hydrogen ion is equal to the amount of hydroxide ion. We solved the titration problem using the equation of the molarity of the titrant times the volume of the titrant is equal to the molarity of the titrate times the volume of the titrate. Titration curves are the monitoring of the pH of the titrate during the addition of titrant. The pH starts at the pH of the titrate and ends up near the pH of the titrant. And that concludes the lecture. pH shows up everywhere. It is worth getting on top of. <laughs>